Thank you all very much for coming out. We don't have a lot of time, but we are proud to be presenting Congressman Ron Paul here tonight. I'm the president of Treasure Island Coins. Uh, you can find our booth back there. I won't say any more about us. Long before I had any interest in politics, I had heard of Ron Paul, and what I heard really stood out to me. I heard stories about how he was consistently standing against the established political culture in Washington, D.C., and how this had earned him the nickname Dr. No for always voting according to his convictions. And as he said, he would never vote for legislation unless the proposed measure ex was expressly authorized by the Constitution. Anyone I asked about him said that he never stood any chance of making it anywhere in Washington and that he was a kook whose ideas were impractical and too extreme. And I thought to myself, I like this guy. This is my kind of guy. In October 2001, issue of Texas Monthly, executive editor Sam Gwynn wrote about Ron Paul, imagine for a moment the perfect congressman. Though he works in Washington, D.C., a city of shameless opportunism, shifting allegiances and flannel mouth pieties, he is both deeply principled and wholly uncompromised. He does not bend with the political winds. He does not take money from corporate political action committees. Lobbyists cannot sway him. To try is a waste of time. He never bargains with his own deeply held beliefs, nor does he cut backroom deals. Because his political views and his personal convictions are in complete harmony, he seldom faces a tough vote. And when politicking for the week is over, he returns to his district to take up his lifelong occupation, which has nothing to do with politics. Congressman Paul is the same today as he was back then. He understands and he places the highest value on the meaning and words of the great bond that has bound us all together as a nation of sovereign states united under a federal constitution. He understands that if this foremost of agreements is violated, then things fall apart and the center cannot hold. And so his career in politics, as well as in writing, has been guided and directed by this pursuit of the highest principles. Currently campaigning for the Republican presidential nomination, he serves on the House Committees on Foreign Affairs and Financial Services, as well as the Joint Economic Committee, and is the chairman of the Financial Services Subcommittee on Domestic Monetary Policy and Technology. He's an author of numerous books and articles, some of which you can find on the back tables. And now, without further ado, please help me welcome to North Dakota the champion of liberty, Ron Paul. for the little disruption, and now I'm in a little bit of a hurry, but I have a little bit of time left. We will be getting on an airplane tonight and trying to get to back to D.C. to be on a program early in the morning. And if you see me on the program in the morning and I look tired, make an excuse for me. <laughs> but it is a real delight to be here. It's fantastic to come for an organization uh, like this. Uh, the uh, North Dakota Policy Council, I think it's really down my alley, alley, and Brett deserves a lot of credit for his magnificent work. I've said very often that uh, ideas have consequences, and uh, ideas are important, and that Washington is a reflection of uh, a prevailing attitude among the people. So if you expect one person to go to Washington and all by himself or herself and change it, it's not likely to happen. They can have an influence, but ultimately what we have in Washington reflects what the prevailing attitudes are. The prevailing attitudes about what government should be, what the people think government should be. Should we have a government take care of us from cradle to grave? Do we have a government that believes that we should be the policemen of the world? Do we have a government that thinks deficits don't matter? And if we do, that's what the government will do. And, and for so long, we have drifted away from what we were given uh, many, many years ago. In the last hundred years, I would say that we have slipped from our conviction that free markets work. And I am convinced that's what we need, a renewed conviction that free markets are what we need and they will work and solve our problems.
Most of you know that I've had a special interest in the subject of monetary policy, and my name is associated with uh, the Federal Reserve. And uh, if I look at the Federal Reserve and I look at our Constitution, many years ago I came down with the conclusion that uh, the Federal Reserve is not authorized and it's not doing a very good job, so we better know what it's doing. We need to audit the Federal Reserve and then work on getting rid of the Federal Reserve. But we've made some progress. I, for many, many years, have worked on getting the audit done, and we uh, had a partial audit uh, uh, passed last year, and then we had some court cases where we got more information about the Federal Reserve. And the information is scary because it's actually a lot worse than I ever anticipated because, you know, the Congress de uh, deals in hundreds of billions, but the Federal Reserve deals in trillions, multiple trillions of dollars in secret, and they protect their, uh, their privacy, and they don't tell us, and we don't exert our responsibility in the Congress to have oversight. But we need a lot more oversight, but we have made some progress. Uh, the Federal Reserve Chairman now holds press conferences, and I would say that is an achievement. He has to answer, start at least pretending he's answering to the people. But you've got to be careful in what he says, because this week he had his third press conference, and uh, he was a little bit apologetic. He wasn't quite bragging like he has in the past, like he could take care of any problem. The only problem with the previous Federal Reserve Chairman is they didn't print the money fast enough, but he would never hesitate to print the money. But then the question came up at the press conference and they, they asked him, well, are you satisfied with what is happening? Is it, has it worked out? And he had to admit, not quite. But guess what his excuse was? He says it was bad luck. <laughs> I would say it's bad ideas is what makes it a mess and they don't solve their problem. And this is what we've done. We have followed the wrong set of standards on economics. They don't understand free markets. They don't understand capitalism. And it's pervasive in, in Washington, D.C. They accept the ideas of a Keynesian economic interventionist system. And that's what we're fighting. One time I was asked, who is it that you are really running against? Which individual do you, you know, dislike the most? And I says, Keynes. <laughs> it's Keynes is the person. <laughs> When I was, I was introduced uh, to economics uh, in the 1960s. I was studying medicine, and uh, when I had a little bit of time off, I became fascinated with reading economics. I came across Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, and I got very much involved in reading Mises, and Hayek, and Rothbard, and Sentholz, and, and the various Austrian economists. And uh, I became convinced they were on the right track, and their predictions uh, uh, were exactly, exactly right. Uh, so at that time I entered into politics just to get a few things off my chest in the early 70s and I remember when I first made the announcement, the first time I ran for office was one of those on a lark, I wanted to talk about something, so I talked to my wife and I said, that, you know, I was going to run for Congress and she said, what in the world would you want to do that for? Because I was very busy in my medical practice and I said, well, I just want to talk about economics. I think that uh, this idea that we now have no linkage of our dollar to gold is going to lead to a lot of bad trouble and I want to talk about it. And she said, well, this could be a very dangerous thing for you to do. And I said, how in the world could it be dangerous? She says, well, you know, you could end up getting elected. <laughs> But I assured her that wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible because I wasn't going to play that role of Santa Claus. What do you want? I'll go vote for it, vote for anything at all. And she says, well, no, she thought the people would come around and they would rather hear the truth than hearing a bunch of lies that they can't believe any longer. So. You know, the free market is obviously a wonderful thing, and we had this uh, great experiment in this country. We had the freest market, and uh, we had the most freedom, and we had the, the most prosperity. But it doesn't, it's not that way anymore. We, we, have, we have the biggest debt of anybody in the history of the world, and uh, we're much poorer. In the, last 30, uh, in, the, in the last 10 years, since the year 2000, we've created no new jobs, and there's 30 million new people. Real unemployment rate is now over 20% if you count everybody that's looking for work. So we're not in the driver's seat anymore, and yet we haven't slowed up on spending. They, there's such an addiction to spending, 
And like I said, people in Washington get reelected by spending money and re responding to the people. Right now, though, I think the people are starting to wake up and the message of liberty and the message of free markets is becoming much more popular. So uh, I, would, I would say that we have still, you know, a, a long way to go, but we have to quit deceiving ourselves. We can't, uh, we can't lie to ourselves. We have to be honest with ourselves. And quite frankly, this country hasn't admitted that it's in bankruptcy. We're bankrupt. We can't pay the bills. This very week, our uh, debt went past our GDP. It's the first time in the history, but the whole world is like that. It's all based on pyramiding of debt and pyramiding deposits. It's all based on, on uh, spending money. And, they're, and now for these last four or five years, that's all they've been doing is spending more money and printing more money. And they think it's gonna solve the problem. And it can't possibly solve the problem. My approach is different. My, my conclusion is that there's too much spending. So, so my proposal for what a president should do and what a Congress should do if they were serious is cut one trillion dollars out of the budget the first year. And that would include cutting five departments. There are too many departments in Washington. We don't need them all. And for a starter, we'd get rid of about five of them. Top of the list would be the Department of Education. You don't need a Department of Education. But we would also have to change our attitude in order to cut about uh, the role of government in the economy, in our personal lives, as well as overseas spending. So I think the most vulnerable spending where we could get the spending cut and try to work our way out of it and take care of people who have become dependent, the elderly and those who depend on medical care. I don't think you have to start there. I think it's wrong to start there. And if we're going to work our way out of it, where's the easiest place to cut? I would say the overseas spending, all the foreign aid, all the foreign intervention. And this would mean, this would mean we would change the foreign policy and we'd quit fighting all these wars and we'd bring our troops home. Wars, our wars over in the Middle East right now cost us $10 billion every month, and that is unsustainable. Uh, when when uh, empires get too big and they spread too thinly around the world, this is, eventually brings those empires down. And we're on the verge of this. We're in 130-some countries. We have 900 bases. And there's no serious attempt to cut anything in Washington, not in one nickel out of the military budget. Now, some people say, well, that'll ruin our national defense. I would say it would improve our national defense. We wouldn't be wasting all this money. We would defend this country, not causing all these problems around the world. There's a distinction between military spending and defense spending. Just spending money in the military doesn't make us safer. We spend... We spend... Uh, uh, we spend more money than all the other countries put together. And if you add our money up with our allies, we spend 70% of all the military budgets in the world. 15% is spent by those we consider potential uh, uh, enemies or, you know, that aren't close allies. There's, there's no reason for us to be so intimidated that we can't look at these budgets. Because if there's a downfall in this nation, it isn't going to be because somebody invaded us. It's going to be our downfall because we have destroyed our civil liberties here at home. At the same time, we've destroyed our own economy. <laughs> One question I've asked myself over the many years is, why is it that if the free market it produces the most goods and services and distributes them more fairly than any other system, why is it that conservatives and libertarians have done such a poor job in delivering that message? Because we aren't in charge, there's no doubt about it. I'm, uh, I'm under the conviction that we're moving in that direction and groups like this are doing the right kind of things to change people's mind. But up until now, we've had a message that we haven't matched it because the other side sort of comes along and they grab the moral high ground. 
They say the government's going to take care of you. You can have free education and free medical care and food stamps, food stamps for the rich and the poor, and we're going to take care of the world. And we sit back and we, we don't generally have an answer for that. But today, the reason why they're listening more so than ever is the, is the failure of that system is glaring us in the face. Not only the bankruptcy, but the failure of our foreign policy, the wars that last 10 years, the invasion of our privacy. The Constitution was designed to make the government open, that we knew everything about the government, and the Fourth Amendment was to protect our privacy. Today, tragically, the Patriot Act and other things destroys our privacy, and now they expect everything should be secret in the government. That should be reversed. To understand the market economy, we have to understand the principles of liberty. We have to understand exactly where liberty comes from. Liberty doesn't come from our government. Liberty, uh, according to Jefferson and many others, it comes from our creator. It comes to us in a natural manner. And that means our life comes to us as a natural right and therefore our liberty to run our own lives and be responsible people come. Uh, and the, the responsibility falls on us. The consequence of that, of those beliefs should be, if you have a right to your life and your liberty, you ought to have complete right to the fruits of your labor that belongs to you. But when we allow our government to do all these things, all the mischief they do, they need revenue, so the argument always is, what are you gonna do with the tax code? How are we gonna raise the revenue? I talk about the spending because my argument is that all spending is a tax. Because once they take your, take, uh, uh, once they start uh, spending the money, they have to collect it. They will raise your taxes the best they can. They then will borrow, which means that it's your debt and you have to earn money to pay it off and pay the interest. Then also the resorting to the printing of money. So they print the money, they dilute the value of the money, your prices go up and that's a tax. So spending is indeed uh, the problem. And uh, we have to address that or our conditions are going to get much, much worse. Today, the burden of debt is just overwhelming. Uh, our GDP and the national debt now are even, not only in this country, but around the world, they're even. So, uh, and this has never, been, ne never happened before. But if you believe in the individual liberty and the right to your life and your, liber and your liberty and the fruits of your labor, means that the market has to be free. People will argue with this and they grab the moral high ground by they saying, oh, you bunch of people who just believe in liberty, that means you, the corporations will run roughshod over us. What are they doing to us today? They're running roughshod over us. You know, the corporations, um, and this doesn't, this doesn't mean all corporations, but the big corporations, take drug companies, insurance companies, they direct the laws with the FDA and, the, and all the medical programs that are very influential. Guess who writes the regulations on banks? The banking lobbyists uh, come in and, and write the regulations. So if, if we want to understand this, we have to understand what the market is about. And if you had one word to define what the market is all about, other than the, the, other than the understanding concept, uh, concept of liberty, because it's your right to life and run your own life and be productive, it is property. You can't have a market economy if you don't understand private property. Tragically, private property has been severely uh, curtailed in this country. There's hardly a thing we can do without umpteen permit, permits from our local governments all the way up to the federal government, and then we have to charge, they charge us rent to even stay on the land, and, uh, and yet they still call it private property. We don't. But the challenge will be, oh, well, uh, there'll be no regulations and uh, everybody will be uh, taken advantage because they will be rich and there will be no protection of the environment. And that's not true. It's not true. The regulations of the free market are, are very, very strict. If the free market was uh, in, in, in place, say, when you have a crisis with bankruptcies, the free market rules are you go bankrupt. You don't take the money from the middle class Americans and take the money and buy all the bad debt and bail out the people who had been speculating and getting themselves into trouble. Instead, we dump the debt on the middle class and then they lose their jobs and then they lose their houses 
proving the fact that government intervention, whether they're trying to give us free houses or free medical care, it just doesn't work. There are many who say that we should, uh, you know, save a lot of money. And if you look at the waste, fraud, and abuse, there's billions and billions of dollars of waste, fraud, and abuse. And they expect that if all of a sudden they can change the nature of government and make sure they're never wasteful, they never commit fraud, and they never abuse anything, we could balance our budget. That's a dream. That's what governments are. They're wasteful, and they're fraudulent, and they're abusive. But we must understand that the, uh, the market will, as well, protect the environment. Uh, it's when big corporations and governments at the time of the Industrial Revolution actually permitted uh, pollution. But if you're a free market person and you believe in property, you have no right to pollute your neighbor's property. You don't have a right to uh, pollute your neighbor's air or water. And the market would come out and say, no, you have violated my rights and it should be stopped. But too long, for too long, governments and, and big business were able to do this. So what was their solution? Well, let's have a regulatory agent that comes, that comes in and preempts everything you do and regulate you to death. And they create the EPA. Well, I'll tell you what, if you had free markets, you wouldn't need the EPA at all. It would take care of itself. <laughs> Reg regulations are very, very expensive, and uh, regulating the economy to me is, uh, is annoying because I think it should be treated like regulating anybody with the First Amendment, with prior restraint. We don't for a minute accept the idea that the government should regulate as bad as the media are so often. We don't believe the government should go in and say, well, well we want to watch everything you say because sometimes you say things are wrong and you're going to hurt people and you might commit libel and therefore we have to regulate you to prevent harm being done. We don't do that, but there are rules against it. If they get into trouble, they have to, uh, you know, live up to the standards of, of, of the law. But when it comes to your property and your land and what you're making and what you're doing, there's always prior restraint with the assumption that the business people are going to hurt people rather than saying the purpose of a businessman is to make profits. The way to make profits is to take care of the consumer. That's what markets do. They are rewarded by satisfying the consumer. Austrian economics teaches that the consumer is king. If there's any one place you can use democracy, it should be this term in the market. When you buy some of a product and it's a good product and you make somebody rich because they give you the best product at the best price, uh, this is a vote by the consumer. But today, the government is so much involved. Uh, before you produce a product, they regulate the labor costs and then they overtax and all the other regulations. But it's been both sides. You know, when Enron went bankrupt, the Republicans were in charge. So they say, well, we just didn't have enough regulations. So they passed Sarbanes-Oxley. Turns out now that it's cost us a trillion dollars on business people to enforce Sarbanes-Oxley. So when, then we have another crisis come. We have the market crashes. Oh, we need more regulation. So we come up with Dodd-Frank. Guess what? It's a cost of another trillion dollars. So there's trillions and trillions of dollars. What does it do? It discourages people from investing. This is what they, they did during the Depression. The government got way too involved, wouldn't allow the corrections to, to occur, and the Depression lasted 15, 16 years. And, and we're doing the same thing. Japan did the same thing. So when the government messes up, when the Federal Reserve creates a bubble, and when the market tries to correct it, the very best thing you can do is just get out of the way and let the market take over and let the adjustment come. We in this country are facing a crisis, but we're not as bad off as some others were, especially when the Soviet system collapsed. Their traditions weren't like ours. We have great traditions. We once knew and understood what private property was. We understood what sound money was. We understood what contracts were. And all these things, just we need to revive an interest in it and an understanding in it and just restore those values because that is what made us great and very wealthy in, in the past. 
But so far, since we have done the opposite, we've just keep big, dig, uh, digging deeper and deeper holes for ourselves. But what we are witnessing now, and it's been declared that we have entered this era uh, in 2008, because this is the big one. This is the big bubble that has burst. Uh, and the bubble has been building since ever since August 15, 1971, when the last link of our dollar to gold was severed. And since that time, there has been this building of a huge bubble. Every recession we had, there was an attempt to correct that. But always the people and the Congress and Keynesian economics taught, don't allow it to happen. The only the reason we are having the recession, the people aren't spending enough money and the government's not spending enough money. So this time, they tried the same thing. So since uh, 2008, they're spending more money. Guess what? We ran up to a wall of debt. And, and the, de and the de deficits have exploded. What has the Fed run into? A wall of, uh, of, of desperation because their tool was always to lower interest rates. Well, when you lower interest rates to about 1% and you have a 4% inflation rate, that's a negative interest rate. How much more negative can you go? They've run out of their tools. Bernanke is no longer ever gonna be lucky again. He can't be. But we have, to, we have to be more than lucky. We have to have the right ideas. And this is why I'm delighted to, to come to groups like this that dedicate themselves to teaching the right ideas, the importance of property, the importance of the market system. And uh, this, this is what changes the world. There's more groups like this developing around the country. There's quite a few now. 20 or 30 years ago, there were essentially none. There were just a few people out there. So what is exciting today is not only are there many who have been part of the remnant who believed and understood what freedom was all about, but now we have a large number of young people in our universities who know what's going on, they don't like what they see, and they're joining us and they say they want their freedom, they'd like to opt out of the system, they'd like to assume responsibility for themselves. That's where I get a lot of encouragement from the college campuses. That is a good sign. The wonderful part about freedom, I see it as one unit, is a freedom. It isn't economic freedom. Economic freedom and personal liberty are one and the same. We shouldn't have defenders of personal liberty but not economic liberty. We shouldn't have economic liberty and not defend personal liberty. And if we understand that, it means sound money. It means a limitation of government. We should never give the government the responsibility of trying to teach us all to be virtuous and responsible because every time the government tries to do something like that, it fails. And we don't need a government that thinks that they know everything and that we are so wonderful that we should use bombs and missiles and force to tell other people around the world to be like us. I would say that our goodness should show through. We should work hard, have a free market, prosperous economy, and make sure that people see what we do and decide they would like to emulate us. That is a much better way than a resorting of use of force to force ourselves on the people of the world. Freedom is a relatively new idea. It's been around just uh, several hundreds of years and totalitarianism has been around for thousands of years. We are drifting toward totalitarianism. The world is engulfed with totalitarian planners, all the do-gooders. But we must restore our confidence that a free society gives us the answers and the satisfaction for our personal lives as well as our economic liberty and our prosperity and will provide the best chance of living in a peaceful world. Thank you very much.